kick this pony. All right, friends, welcome to your free GMAT prep hour. I am your host today, Reed Arnold. It is September 8th, 2019. Uh, quick plug, if you are looking for other free GMAT prep options from Manhattan Prep, you can take the first course of our full nine week course for free. That's 11% of a GMAT course uh, that is just available to you right now. You can go see, try out different teachers, see which one you like, um, kind of pick one and stick with it. All right, uh, it's, it's a great option, great chance to get, honestly, we talk about some big, big, even if you don't want to take the course, it's a free lesson and we cover some big, big stuff, especially in data sufficiency. Um, so go, try out a teacher, see what you think. Um, uh, Omer, the quant link that I just sent out should be in the chat right above you, um, right above the message you just typed. Uh, we also have Interact On Demand course. You can, you can try out the first, first few sessions of that. Uh, visit that link at the bottom, manhattanprep.com slash gmat slash resources to learn more, but we have a few free options for you. Um, we also have wonderful books. We have a new book coming out soon. Um, GMAT 2020 is coming, so we're revamping our course for that. So lots of, lots of fun things coming from Manhattan Prep. Today's lesson, today's free GMAT prep hour is twitching the GMAT part two. Some of you might have been around here for part one a few weeks ago. Uh, that was when I took the GMAT live. I took the quant section live in front of y'all. I'm doing the same thing today, except I'm doing the verbal section. Um, I do apologize. This means this will be a little bit more than a free hour, just because for one, it's already four minutes in and uh, we haven't started this. And then it's a 65 minute session uh, uh, section and then We'll see how I did, so that'll take a few minutes. So it'll be probably about an hour 20, free GMAT hour 20. Um, for those of you that don't know what Twitch is, I don't really either, but as I understand it, you basically watch people play games and, and they talk about the game that they're playing, I think usually video games. Um, and so this is that with the GMAT. And honestly, the more you think about the GMAT as a game or a puzzle, the better. Uh, and that's what it is. It is, um, uh, it is a, a, puzzle it's a rubik's cube for you to find out i see that the link to the first section might not be uh yeah for some reason it might not have sent in the chat um we'll deal with that after after this lesson's over but if anything you can just google twitch the gmat free gmat prep hour manhattan prep and it'll show up but we can talk after the recording's over and uh make sure you all get the link that you that you need to part one okay just some thoughts before we dive into this verbal section one is that I, unlike last time where I did everything on screen, I tried to think about this and I just, I think there's no way I can't avoid doing some handwriting off screen. It's just gonna be too much trouble to try to make a passage map for the reading comp um, uh, to draw the premise conclusion stuff that I like to do for, for critical reasoning. I'm gonna be doing some work off screen, but I will be talking through what I'm thinking. I will also be, and this is something that's actually an advantage to me as I do this, I can actually annotate the screen, which you can do when you take the real test, but I'm actually gonna be able to underline and highlight and kind of circle things. So that's actually, we'll be able to see where I'm looking with that. So that'll actually be uh, kind of interesting. I've never taken a test where that's an option before. Um, I might've seen some questions before because I teach this test and sometimes people come in with questions. I'll tell you if I have, I can almost guarantee I won't remember it. I, I tend to not see as many, many verbal questions from official tests, but if I see one, I'll, I'll let you know. I will make mistakes as I did last time. Um, it's great news. You don't have to be perfect to get a good score on this test. I will speak out loud. Um, I will probably not read out loud because as I mentioned before, if I read, I tend not to think. So like when I'm reading the reading comp passage, I won't read the passage out loud, but what I will do is stop every now and then and tell you what I've thought about so far, if that makes sense. Um, I will be taking a test myself. That means sometimes I, you will see some hard questions. That means sometimes I will move pretty quickly. That's okay. This is my job. I do it for money. Um, so that's, that's just part of, uh, part of, part of the game, I think. Um, my goals, I don't want to fall more than three minutes behind. And if I do, I want to make an adjustment. I want to miss, I, uh, verbal is actually my strength, uh, historically on this test. And so that means I'm going to miss fewer questions than frankly, you ever need to worry about not missing. Um, I hope to miss three to 10 questions. If you're scoring below a 38, you want to expect to miss eight to 14 questions. If you're scoring at about a 40, you're probably going to miss five to 10 questions. Uh, verbal does tend to, in my, it seems anyway, uh, verbal, you t I seem to see fewer misses than quant. Um, it's still a lot though. It's still not a game of getting every question right. It's just a little bit different than the quant algorithm based on my experience. Um, I don't want to get perturbed when the questions go my way. I want to move on, save myself from making stupid mistakes. Um, yeah, 
get the questions I know I'm capable of doing. So what, what I want you to look for as I'm doing this is I want you to look at what decisions I'm making and why I make those decisions. I want you to hear what I'm thinking about when I work through the different questions and the different question types and really compare like, how do I think about this? And you know, what does a GMAT expert think about this? Is it different? What, what are they seeing that I don't see? Um, that doesn't mean I won't make mistakes, I will. Sometimes you'll see something and I'll miss it, that's gonna happen. But by and large, you know, what am I doing that's different? Notice that I will get confused and I'll have to move on, that's fine. Notice that I will sometimes slow myself down and just make sure I didn't rush. Uh, and I want you to notice, this is a big one, this second to last one, how much time I spend not on the answers, especially in critical reasoning and reading comp. How much time I spend thinking before I go to the answer choices. And in sentence correction, notice what I'm looking for. Notice how I'm not thinking about what sounds best at all. That, that pretty much doesn't come into play until I'm absolutely out of other options. Um, and notice how I'll be keeping pace, okay? Uh, all right, friends, so the downside to this is that I will not be able to see a chat, just so you all know. There will not be much chat and response to this situation here. Um, I'm actually going to just minimize the chat and not even have it, because that's just gonna distract me if I'm not careful. Um, I have here the end of the quant section that I just clicked through. I will get a terrible score. Um, let's just answer the question since we're here. Which of the following is not an integer? Um, okay, so, or sorry, which following is an integer? Uh, well, that's gonna be an integer because that's gonna cancel out six factorial. That's gonna be an answer, an integer because it's gonna cancel out eight factorial. This is just 12 choose five. So I know they're all three integers. Okay, so we're gonna get the last question right at least. One, two, and three. Double check that. See, no, I have to double check. Okay, I feel pretty good about it. Okay, oh, there's, no, oh, forget it, we won't do that one. Add an extra one left. Okay, here we go. Now we are on to the verbal section of the GMAT. So it's gonna be 65 minutes of rip roaring fun. Optional break, I've already had it. Let's jump in. Okay. Let's just have a presentation. Including among these. So first thing I notice is that we have a modifier split at the beginning among these included, which includes. Okay, it's not gonna be which includes because that's supposed to be the company and the company doesn't include the threat. That's just a rule of which. Uh, okay, and we'll stop with the meeting. Investors. Them, I don't like that pronoun them. Uh, the threat from. Okay, so I don't like the them, but I'm not sure, let's see. Um, I see a split of four and of at the end, and it's a decline in sales of, it's not a decline in sales for, that's kind of an idiom. Always look at the end of the underline. Sometimes the best split is there. Um, I don't like which includes, so I guess I'm already done. So I guess D, I, didn't even, I haven't even read all of D yet. Uh, among them, the threat of, that feels pretty good. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so we have CR now. So the first thing I wanna do is read the question. The argument is flawed. So I wanna know why the argument is flawed. That's similar to a weakened question. So let's find the premise conclusion now. Okay, so I know what the conclusion is. It's that last sentence that Meadowbrook more likely to be victims of violent crime. Why do we think that? Because in Meadowbrook, the number of uh, the violent crime rate, not number, be careful, is 60% higher than it was four years ago. Whereas Park, Parkdale has only increased 10%. So obviously Meadowbrook is, you're more likely to be a victim of violent crime than Parkdale. Okay, so step three is think. So I've read the question, I've deconstructed the argument, now I just wanna think about stuff. Um, and I wonder, like I have an, a percent change in the rate of violent crime, but I don't know where they're starting from. This is just kind of a math, almost a math situation here. Um, uh, the starting point matters a lot on, uh, in that game. So I'm kind of curious about, uh, as a flaw, the fact that it's not considering where we started. Um, changes in the population density, that's not so important since everything is a rate. 
how the pot rate of population grows. So there are, I don't care about that. The ratio of violence and nonviolent crimes. I don't really care about. Yeah, so here it is. I want to know, it, it fails to account the violent crime rates, where they started four years ago. That's what I'm looking for. How Meadowbrook's expenditures, I don't care about their expenditures. That seems to be not very relevant. Okay, next question. Another CR, so was the following true? Most calls into question. So we are on a weekend question. The reasoning which the plan is based, so I'm gonna write premise conclusion. Again, I'm doing this off screen. I apologize, it's just too much trouble to type. So. First sentence feels like a premise, but I'm not sure yet. Deceased. So There's a plan question. So soybean growers need to stop growing soybeans and start with cotton taking advantage of the high price of cotton to increase their income. So we wanna increase our income. So the final step is switching to, uh, switching to cotton, switching from soybeans to cotton is gonna increase income. There's the conclusion. Switching from soybeans to cotton increases income. Why do we think that? Why do we think this is going to increase income? Because there's been an insect infestation increasing the price of cotton and cotton grows fast. Okay, so premise, cotton is hurt by a certain insect and it grows quickly, so we're gonna switch from soybean to cotton, that's going to increase our income. Okay, um, so cotton, insects, and it grows fast. Now, now I think, I do my reasoning and I think about the flaws in this argument. Um, and I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if the insect infestation is gonna to spread to their crops. Maybe it's already there and it's not affecting the soybeans, but it is going to affect the cotton beans or the cotton plants. Um, maybe if too many people do it, the price is gonna lower again and that's gonna undo the effects. I kinda of like that, that feels GMAT supply and demand. Now I go to my answers. I just do a few thoughts, few thinking first, a little bit of thinking. Okay. The cost of raising soybeans has increased significantly. That's a good reason to switch to cotton, not a bad reason. I'm trying to weaken the switch to cotton. Test of new affected cotton crops. Okay, that strengthens. That means it's, you know, you can protect against infestation. In the past several years, there's been a cotton goods made out of cotton. If there is, if there, mm, I, I, I don't like that one. Uh, it feels trap. It feels like a trap. Many consumers consider cotton cloth a necessity rather than a luxury and be willing to pay significantly higher prices for cotton goods than they currently pay. Okay, that's a good reason to switch to cotton. The species has never been known to attack. So I like E. C feels like the trap answer here, but just because there hasn't been a sharp increase in the demand for cotton, that doesn't change anything because there's been a big drop in the supply of cotton. But if the species that infects cotton plants doesn't attack soybean plants, then it just might not, it might be there not attacking the soybean plants. So I'm gonna say E. Notice that that's kind of what I was thinking. I might miss that one, but that, that was kind of what I was looking for here before I even went to the answers. Okay, sentence correction. Um, first thing I noticed for split, we have a change in subject here. The author versus the play versus it was. Um, so that makes me think maybe modifier was later made, later made, okay. so. It, Maybe a change of description. First commercially successful drama on Broadway. Okay, so this whole thing is description. It's describing the play. It's not describing the author. It's not describing in 1959. It's not describing it was. It's not describing the author. So it's either D or E just based on the description alone. A raise in the sun and was later made. So this right here says a raisin in the sun made it into a film. That's not what I want. So I say D. Oops. Okay. Another critical reasoning. Haven't gotten a reading comp yet, which is always, you kind of want to know when your reading comps come. So until now, which the following is an assumption. So let's find the assumption question. Let's do premise conclusion. Now only 
So I know there's going to be a change about the injectable vaccines. I think I might have seen this one. It's been a long time. So there's only been injectable vaccines. Parents are reluctant to subject children to the pain of injections. But adults who are at risk of serious complications from influenza are commonly vaccinated. Parents are reluctant. So parents don't like to do injections, but adults often get the injections. And there's only been injections available. Now there's obviously going to be something that's not an injection. A new influenza vaccine, painlessly in a nasal spray, not injections. It's good for children. Great, so the children can get it. However, so change. Since children seldom develop complications from influenza, no significant, okay, so conclusion here is the end, is that there's no significant public health benefit from vaccinating children. No public health benefit from vaccinating children, even though now it's easier to vaccinate them with this spray. Why is it not helpful? Because children seldom develop serious complications. So basically influenza, not so dangerous for children. Not so bad for kids. Therefore, there's no reason uh, that this new spray really has any public health benefit. So I, I'm trying to find an assumption. Well, to find assumptions, I ruin the argument. Okay, assumptions keep the argument from being ruined. So it would ruin the argument if there was a public health benefit to vaccinating children, even though they don't really get that sick from it. And so I'm thinking maybe, really what I'm thinking is, is will adults get sick from kids who are unvaccinated? Uh, that's really what I'm thinking. I don't like, it doesn't feel GMAT-y to think like, well, maybe it's nice enough to help the kids. That's not really what we're going for. We want to say that helping the kids is going to help the adults. So I'm assuming the assumption is that helping the kids won't help the adults. Okay. Um, Mm, that's not necessary. The new vaccine uses the same mechanism just as injectable vaccines. That's not necessary. It can be a totally different way. The vaccine is affordable for adults. I'm not talking about affordability. The adults do not contract influenza primarily from children who have influenza. Let's negate this, the negation test. If adults do contract influenza from children who have influenza, then this argument's ruined. There is a public health benefit to vaccinating children. Since that's what ruins the argument, if I negate it, I think it's D. The nasal spray vaccine is not effective when administered to adults. That's fine. We're talking about vaccinating kids. So I say D. How am I doing on pace? Verbal pacing is tough, but I'm doing okay. Basically, nine questions is about 16 minutes. So I'm doing all right. Um, another CR question here. Uh, strengthen, which of the following provides the strongest support? So I'm strengthening an argument. The prairie vole, a small North American grassland rodent, breeds year-round. Okay, and a group of voles living together consists primarily of an extended family, often including two or more litters. So the prairie vole breeds year-round, and they live together as a family. Okay. Okay, so this is a, an argument about causation. And the conclusion is that the seasonal variation in group size can be explained by variation in mortality among young voles. So conclusion is that this last sentence, seasonal variation in size, in group size, I'm taking notes here on the side, can be explained, is caused by, is caused by variation in mortality of young moles, young voles, whatever. Why do we think that? Because they often live in large groups from autumn and winter. Autumn and winter is a large group. And spring through autumn is small group. So since there's a change in size, I'm assuming it must be because there's a bunch of things dying. And basically I want to support that idea. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but first thing I wanna think about what would weaken the idea. And it would weaken the idea if anything else explained why they live in different group sizes in different seasons. And so to strengthen that argument, I'm gonna make it less likely that another reason explains the change in size. It is the spring and early summer that prairie vole communities contain the highest proportion of young voles. I don't think that's relevant. 
I'm talking about the number of voles, not what proportion is young or old. I don't know enough from that. I'll keep it, but I'm not, I don't feel good about it. Prairie vole populations vary dra dramatically in size from year to year. Well, that explains year to year, but I'm comparing season to season. This is comparing something that I don't particularly care about. So I don't like, I'm pretty sure it's not be. The prairie voles subsist primarily on broadleaf plants that are abundant only in spring. That but why is there a size why is there a size in the group variation that that doesn't explain why the group size is so different in fact that makes me think there would be more voles in the spring i just don't like see that didn't that didn't really uh, change anything winters in the prairie voles habitat are harsh with temperatures that drop well below freezing I mean, that would explain why a lot of them die off, but the point is that they're, they live in large groups from autumn through winter. So I just don't, I don't think that supports this idea that it's a bunch of people die. Like the argument is that a lot of people die in spring. This says, this says that they don't die in spring. This says that they die in winter. Um, that's year to year. So, okay, snakes are active only from spring to early. Yeah, so here's a reason why they die in spring. Yeah, E. Okay, New York City, so still no critical reasoning. I'm getting a little bummed about that, because I think I'm falling a little bit behind. New York City ordinance says uh, regulated, regulated, regulating, regulating, so we have verbs versus modifiers. Okay, granted and granting, verbs versus modifiers. Puts me in the world of structure and meaning. Um, okay, so New York City Ordinance 1897, regulated spices mandated. So we have parallelism. We have a list of parallelism being drawn here. Regulated, um, regulated, mandated, uh, required, and they granted pedestrians a right of way. Not technically grammatically wrong, but just seems kind of silly. Um, See, like the way this is written, this mandated of maximum speed doesn't really link to the use of bicycles. And I know it's supposed to link to the use of bicycles. Why? Because I'm a person and I get what this sentence is trying to say. So I don't like that this is a list of parallel things because it's not actually clear that it's all about bicycles. Um, that's just meaning. The meaning and the structure don't match. So I don't like A. Um, so B is going to be gone for a similar reason. Regulated, mandated, required, granting. No, 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 no. Uh, a New York City ordinance event regulating the price, the use of bicycles. Okay, so this at least describes the ordinance as about bicycles. And then it mandated a maximum speed, required to keep their feet on the pedal and handlebars. Uh, but then we don't finish the parallelism list. It mandated, required, and it granted. That's out. Uh, regulating the use of bicycles, mandating a speed. No, bad. I can already tell it's bad. Uh, regulating the use of bicycles, mandated a maximum speed, required cyclist, and granted. So I say E. Notice how many words I don't read. That's fun. I don't read a bunch of the words in sentence correction. All of my students, not all of my students, but most of my students read every word. They read so many of the words, and that's just not how you get fast and good at sentence correction. You're reading for the wrong things. Um, okay, we have another CR, premise conclusion, which is the following will be most important to ascertain in evaluating the argument. So we're in assumption family world. Premise conclusion. Lyme disease is caused by bacterium transmitted from humans to deer ticks. Okay, so Lyme disease uh, goes to humans through ticks. Deer ticks get the bacterium while in the larval stage. Okay, get bacteria as larval by feeding on mice, by feeding on white-footed mice. However, certain other species on which the larvae feed do not, but some things don't have the bacteria. Okay, so they get it from the mice. If the population of these other species were increased, more of the larvae would be feeding on uninfected hosts, so the number of ticks acquiring the bacteria would decline. Okay, so conclusion uh, is that basically feed on other species. Well, if other species go up, Certain other species go up, uh, larvae eat them, therefore lower uh, the ticks with the bacteria. Why do I think that? Well, because they get bacteria from white-footed mice and they eat other stuff that doesn't have the bacteria. Okay, so I wanna, again, think about this first. 
before I go to my answers, I see that there's a lot of causation here. And I want to wonder if maybe the other species populations could, could grow up. Maybe the population could go up, but we actually wouldn't see the number of ticks with the bacterium decline. How could that happen? Well, um, I mean, all they have to do is eat one white-footed mice, mouse. So, you know, maybe they, even if they eat the other stuff a lot, they still might get, you know, somehow they're going to get back to the white. Basically, I'm wondering, is there any way they're going to get back to the white-footed mouse? That's really the question. Uh, is there any way, even if the population goes up, will they still get to the white-footed mouse? Because that's where they get the disease. So whether populations of other species uh, are... F we already know that's true. That doesn't really, we already know they had options of food. Um, whether the size of the deer tick population is currently limited by the ability of the animals for the ticks. I'm curious about it. it uh, I'm gonna come back to it. Whether the, invented, whether the infected deer tick population could be controlled by increasing the number of animals that prey on white-footed mice. That's not, that's a totally different plan. That's just totally irrelevant. Whether deer ticks that were not infected as larvae can become infected as adults by feeding on deer. On which, inf whether deer ticks that were not infected can become infected as adults by feeding on deer. Uh, curious about D. Whether the other species on which deer tick larvae feed harbor any other bacteria, don't care about other bacteria. Okay, so I think B or D. I'm falling a little bit behind, so I don't want to. I don't really want to think too much about this. Um, frankly, I, I I think it's B, uh, because if they if they can get a higher population by eating other stuff, that just means more ticks to eat the white-footed mice, even if it's a lower proportion of infectation. I got to move on. Um, another, oh, it's an accept question. But I don't even want to do this. Hmm. I'm I'm running behind, um, and I, it's an accept question. So screw it. I'm out. Okay, uh, currently 26 billion barrels a year. Okay, so we have world consumption in the world. Short little underline that actually terrifies me. Um, that's a description. It's not the world. The world is not 26 billion barrels a year. The rise eh, it might be 26. Is 2% annually. No, I think it's describing world consumption. Oil is not 26 bar billion barrels a year. That doesn't make sense. The world's oil is not 26 billion barrels a year. The rise in the rate. No, I think it's A. Still haven't seen a reading comp. Got to be next. What on earth? That's bad news for the end. I got to make sure I don't fall too far behind because that reading comp is coming and four of them. Um, as a result of a supernova explosion, every, okay, wait, uh, neutrinos, neutrinos. I have done this one before and I actually taught it in a, another video. So I know this one pretty well, uh, but I'm still gonna go through the process. Um, so we have a difference in subject, which makes me think modifiers and meaning. As a result of a supernova explosion, every human being on earth was bombarded by 100 billion neutrinos. Fortunately, neutrinos are harmless elementary particles. Okay, yeah, so I remember this one. Uh, it, has to with, it has to do with modifiers and meaning. So fortunately, what is fortunate? It's not fortunate that, um, that these elements are neutrinos. That's not what's fortunate. It's not fat fortunate that the harmless elementary particles are produced in nuclear reactions. That's not for The thing that's fortunate is that they are harmless. So uh, it's fortunately neutrinos are harmless elementary particles. Okay, so I like C. Um, neutrinos are elementary particles. No, I don't like B. Neutrinos are harmless elementary particles. Okay, so I like A and C, which emphasize that neutrinos are harmless elementary particles. Um, produced in nuclear reactions and which. I don't like and which, that's not parallel, uh, that are produced and that interact, I like A. So I had done it before, but I didn't remember it was A, I still have to basically do it again anyway. Um, reading comp, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument. So premise conclusion, we are weakening an argument. Man, I'm not looking forward to reading comp. Uh, okay, the country of Barisia. Self-sufficient in both grain and meat. 
speaking of food, they eat more meat as they get richer and it takes several pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. Okay, so this, I see that this is gonna be a premise. So as they get wealthier up in money, they are upping their meat consumption and lots of grain to make meat. Takes lots of grain for meat. They usually make both. Therefore, since per capita, and it's gonna keep rising, the money's gonna to continue to rise, but increases, we're not gonna have not more grain, same amount of grain. Um, it's probably gonna import grain. So I have two questions already before I go to my answers. Why don't we import meat? Because if we can import meat, we won't import grain, we'll just import meat. Um, or are we gonna eat so much? I, I've seen a question like this recently. There's several versions of this question. And I, I might, might've seen this one, but my question is why are, are we gonna import meat or are we gonna eat so much less grain that we can use it to make meat and we don't need to import grain? Because that's that's the that's those are my two things that uh, that would weaken this argument. So when people increase their consumption of meat, they also tend to increase their consumption of grain. That totally uh, strengthens the argument that we're going to need to increase our grain importing per capita. I don't care about income levels of meat. That's not a relevant comparison. Um, per capita consumption of meat has not increased in recent years in those countries from which. Hmm. I'm curious about that one because again, it's about importing meat, which is kind of what I was thinking about. It's more economical for, that's definitely a weakener. It's more economical for them to import meat than grain, then they'll import the meat. Curious about C. Uh, country's population is remain stable. That's not relevant. Okay, so C or D. Per capita, uh, per capita consumption in other countries has not increased. I don't, I don't, C might kind of get to where I'm going, but it requires a lot of leaps. This just says it's cheaper to import meat. And that's a much stronger statement of why they won't import grain maybe. So I'm gonna say D. Oh God, another sentence correction, which is not C and reading help. Uh, the striking differences between the semantic organization and uh, that of versus those of pronouns have and has, subject verb agreement. So the striking differences have led scholars. So the striking differences have led scholars, not has led scholars. Um, striking differences have led scholars. Okay. Between the organization of Native American languages and what am I, I gotta say A or C, and those of European languages, which include grammar and vocabulary. I say A. I don't like that which include, that, that doesn't describe like I want it to. Finally, okay. Um, so, to make my passage map, I'm sorry you're not going to be able to see the notes I take on this. There's no consensus among researchers. Um, so, no consensus on pheromones. Definition of a pheromone. So, pheromones are similar to odorants can be blurry. Some research classify pheromones as a type of odorant. Some people say that they're the same kind of thing. Okay, so right now I just want to take, I, I am at this point of the passage. I just want to kind of think about what's going on here. And we're basically talking about pheromones and how to describe them. Oh, that's not, that thing doesn't move. Uh, we're talking about pheromones and how to describe them and how they're similar to odorants and how some people call them odorants. So it's just like a classification situation. Um, evidence that pheromone responses may not Okay, so this, so this sentence says that um, odorants are consciously detective, detected. 
and some people call them call pheromones odorants but there's evidence that pheromones may not involve conscious odor so this seems like a big section here to me because it's like things know when they have an odorant and sometimes pheromones aren't they're not aware they're getting a pheromone so we have a distinction and distinctions are nice to notice pheromones are processed or whatever all this stuff about where they're processed useless useless the neural connections between this area and brain are separated from those of all so many technical jargon words i just don't care it's about where people detect tone it's details does not process many animal signals not all pheromones work through the vno qualifies pheromones there's the VNO. Okay, so there's like a, lots of things that VNO does. Okay, so the primary purpose is to discuss, like predict an answer. It's to discuss uh, what pheromones are and their comparison to odorants. And I think that's something like that. Um, no, not about these things that process chemicals. That comes into play, that's not the purpose. No. I like C. Not proposing a new definition of pheromones. Are you pheromones should be classic? Not, no, not doing that. It's actually saying it might not be an odorant. I think it's really just saying like, hey, here's a debate about pheromones and what's not a pheromone. According to the passage, the fact that pheromones are processed by the VNO. Okay, so this is the part I was really skimming through. I might have to do some rereading. In many animals, it have, has been taken. So it's a detailed question. According to the passage, it's going to be right in the, in the passage. The fact that pheromones, the answer is going to be right in the passage. The fact that pheromones are processed by the VNO in many animal species has led, has been taken as evidence for which the following. Okay, so we wanna know the fact that pheromones are processed by the VNO. Has been taken as evidence for which the following. So the VNO is separate from the olfactory system. I think that's, so that shows that it's different from the odorants. So the fact that it's detected by the VNO, the fact that pheromones are detected by the VNO shows that it might not be an odorant. I like D. Not B. Not about a behavioral response. I like D. It does not trigger a conscious smell because it's not in the odorant system, which is conscious. It's a detailed question, but it's about the main idea. You know, that's how it is a lot of ways. Okay, uh, a lot of the times. It can be inferred from the passage. This is an inference question. That in classifying pheromones as a type of odorant, the research referred in the highlighted text. So some research clarify, classify pheromones as a type of odorant. So since odorants are consciously detected and some research classify pheromones as an odorant, some researchers must believe that pheromones are consciously detected. That's what I'm looking for. That's my prediction. A, pheromones are perceived consciously. That looks pretty good. Um, that's not it. Uh, yeah, I like A. I am getting tired, friends. I can feel my brain slowing down. Okay, uh, in the mid 1920s, the Hawthorne works of the Western. Okay, wait, uh, first glance that investigated to investigate for investigating. We have a, a, a description workers' performance in working conditions, effects on workers' performance would have on work. Okay, <laughs> was the scene of an intensive series of experiments that, okay, so was the scene that would investigate changes in working conditions as to their effects on workers' performance. That's weird descriptions. Experiments. Uh, I don't like A for the present, the future tent would from the past point of view. I don't like as to their effects. Uh, was the scene of a set of experiments investigating the effects that changes in working conditions would have on workers' performance. I don't hate the uh, series of experiments for investigating uh, what the effects on workers' performances are that changes in working conditions would cause for investigating what the changes are, what the effects are that changes would cause. Changes... 
no, this is, this is going to be kind of an, I'm not going to have a good reason for this one, friends. I'm just, for the sake of time, I got to just kind of move. <sighs> that investigative changes in working conditions is effects on workers' performance. No, to investigate what the effects changes in working conditions would have. I don't hate that. Uh, what the effects would have. No, the effects don't have, no, what the effects would have. It's B, I think. I don't know. Okay, another reading comp, back to my paper here. The US government has a longstanding policy of using federal funds to keep small businesses viable. US policy, I, I always read carefully at first, more carefully than when I go on. Federal funds to keep businesses viable, keep small businesses viable, small business net. Okay, so this is about changes in policy. So paragraph one is changes in policy of small business support. Okay, and how it's, how it's kind of shifted to low income minorities. And so there's a question of, you know, it's okay, so there's been a change. Uh, who gets the recipients of this support? the most economically disadvantaged or those with the best prospects for business success. Okay, so there's a change in how that good was delivered from the government. Paragraph two, the first shift occurred during the 1970s. Okay, so yeah, the 70s focus, started to focus on writing past wrongs. That's the main idea. That's all I need from that. Last paragraph. So another shift. Uh, the goal of increasing numbers was supplanted by the goal of creating and assisting more minority owned substantive firms with future growth potential. service businesses. So late 70s, we still focus on minority businesses, but we want minority businesses with big growth potential. That's the change. Um, not just small service, but big manufacturing, wholesalers, big possibilities. Okay, so we have this policy of supporting small businesses, how it started to support small businesses, then it was used to support um, low-income minorities to right past wrongs. Then it became still that, but also focusing on high growth potential. Sure, that's the story. So the passage mentions which of the following is a basic consideration in administering minority business funding programs. Which of the following as a basic consideration in administering minority, minority business funding programs? When? When are you talking about basic consideration? Um, I don't know, but I got to move. Coming up with businesses for the program, encouraging government agents to use middle and high income minority entrepreneurs. Recognizing the profit potential of small businesses in urban communities, determining who should be the. I guess that's what? No, this one, because that's what the third paragraph, I think E, but I got to move on. We're, I'm running a little behind on time here. Uh, quite a bit, actually. It can be inferred from the ownership gap. Uh, would be narrowed if which was, so the ownership gap held to be a result of past discrimination. So it's about the percentage of businesses that were minority owned versus the proportion of the country that was a minority. Um, and it would be narrowed, inferred. 
if we increase the number of minority owned firms. Okay. Referred would be narrowed if we increase the number of minority owned firms. I don't know. I'm totally lost. <laughs> um, it's not E, I don't think. Uh, self-employed rose to 10% of all self-employed person. I like that because we're trying to get it to 17%, which was the population of, which was the proportion of minorities. I don't know. I got to move on. According to the passage in 1970, funding to minority entrepreneurs focused primarily on which of the following uh, in 1975. Well, depends if it was the early or the late 1970s. But they tried to fix past injustices and then they looked for big growth. So I'm looking for something like that. Um, focus primarily on which of the following. I see two answers that kind of match. Um, awarding subcontracts, no, not about development. I, I don't know. This is the main point of the third paragraph. New goal, sustainability, new goal, to remedy the past effects of discrimination. That's really what I want. The number of minority owned businesses. Uh, I'm going to say B. This is bad. I don't know. I'm, I'm running way behind and man, my head hurts. No, another question. Okay, which of the following describes the function of the second paragraph? Okay, so the second paragraph, that's this one. So that was to talk about when the shift went to really helping uh, the, the, to remedy the effects of past discrimination. And so it's talking about a change in how small businesses were assisted. So that's the A kind of sets it up that there was a change. And then this gives an example of that change. It's not the most striking change. Uh, and explain the rationale presents the results. No, I, I say B. Oh man. Sometimes when you're in the middle of this test, guys, you feel like you're just doing terribly. That's just how it is. But you can't let it shake you. You got to move on. Um, okay, back to sentence correction. The number, it is less. There are, there are, there are as many, that amount. Okay. But today, some 4,000 existed, but today, the number is less than one quarter of the amount. Not one quarter of the amount, that doesn't make sense. It is less, what is it? So I don't like DNE. There are fewer than one quarter of that amount. There are fewer than one quarter. There are fewer than one quarter as many. There are, it's not less because I can count drive-ins. So it's not less, less versus fewer. If anyone watches Game of Thrones, there's a great Stannis moment. Um, there are fewer than one quarter as many. There are fewer than one quarter of that amount. I don't know, this is an idiom and I just don't have time to waste on this. I'm gonna, so 4,000 existed today, there are fewer than one quarter as many. Oh yeah, amount. Yeah, it'd be a number. Amount is uncountable. Yeah, so B. Back to critical reasoning. <clears throat> Information above argues most strongly against which of the following claims. 
interesting. I've never seen a question quite like this before. Argues against one of the following claims. So up front, up top. Junior researchers have long assumed that their hirings depend on the amounts of their published work. People responsible for hiring all their earnings are much more by the overall impact have. So basically, junior researchers, junior researchers think it's the number of work published, whereas the hirers, the people who hire biomedical researchers, say it's the quality. Not really the quality, that's not quite the same, but the impact, how important the, the production has been. So that argues against which of the following claims, argues against which of the following claims. So it's almost an anti-inference question. So this doesn't support which of the following. It's not C, because we're only talking about things that are published. Oh, that's, that's. The argument doesn't argue in favor or against the hirer's judgment. That's about the number of publications and not so much the, unless you consider impact. Oh wait, that's what I, hold up, that's what I want. This is the opposite. This is saying go for, go for a lot of publications and the argument's like, no, the people who hire this, the paragraph, sorry, the paragraph's like, no, the people who hire don't really care about the number, they care about how good it is. So let's say, e. I'm really, I think I'm doing pretty bad on time actually, uh, which is long must be true on the basis of So this is an inference. Total consumption of fish increased by 4.5%. So fish go up 4.5% and poultry went up by 9% and the population went up by 6% in part due to immigration. Okay, so the fish didn't increase as much as the population and the poultry increased by more than the population. So it seems like these immigrants were eating a lot of uh, poultry. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. No, I can't say twice, that's not it. That's, this is trying to make you think 4.5 and 9 is times 2, but that's, that's a growth rate. That's not the same thing as twice as much. Part of their diets. Okay, I got to move on. I'm doing okay on time. I'm not as behind as I thought I was, I think. Uh, okay, small cars. Small cars are more fuel efficient. That are more, so this is a modifier game, maybe. Allows manufacturers to make small cars more fuel efficient. Now, this is them making the cars fuel efficient. I'm trying to say they're making fuel efficient cars. How do I know that? Because I'm a person. I know that's the story. Um, this is they refers to these small cars, but those are the small cars that are more fuel efficient. Those were not at other times. That's a weird modifier problem small cars that are more fuel efficient than those at any other time. Now I'm comparing these small cars to those small cars. That's a better comparison. Um, more fuel efficient small cars than those more fuel efficient cars now than at any time to make more fuel efficient cars now. Any other time in production history. So I like C or E. 
small cars that are more fuel efficient. I don't think it's about the number of small cars. This says they make more fuel efficient small cars. And really what I'm saying is that they make small cars that are more fuel efficient. I know that's what we're trying to say. It's not about the number. It's about how efficient these cars are. So it's got to be C. That's just the meaning. I know that's the meaning. I'm a person. Okay. Based on records, according to records, records. So we have a description versus subject, I suspect. Used to dress, which they dress, dressing, some modifier stuff. Okay. Based on records, ancient Athens. That's a statue of the goddess Athena. Okay, so if one thing I notice here is that we have parallelism kind of late after the underline. That's a fun little trick. And that this robe. So I need to say a robe that. It's got to have a robe that. Not with which to dress, not be. Um, not D, with which they dressed. Not for dressing. It's got to have that parallel structure. Notice how useful that is to just notice a parallelism marker. If you're not reading and noticing that, you're not studying right. Okay, according to each year, collaborated to weave a new woolen robe that they used to dress. Ooh. See, now I'm going to... I might have just really made myself look stupid. Um, collaborated to weave a new robe that they used to dress a statue and that this robe depicted scenes. Collaborated. Ooh, I might have to reformulate how I'm thinking about this. Hmm. Yeah, we need records indicate that this robe. So it's a different that that I'm looking for. I was looking for the wrong that. Records from the ancient Athens indicate that each year they did this and that the robe did this. Yeah, D. So I had kind of the right idea, but the meaning wasn't right if I was trying to match that that. So I had to find a different that. Surface tim Okay, so Europa, Europa, comma. Europa has long been. We have modifiers versus verbs structure meaning same old stuff okay so surface temperatures that are low jupiter's moon europa and it's that's bad structure long considered and to have uh, bad structure we don't have a verb has long been considered as far too cold to support life no and with some miles of water, we never finish the thought, it's B. This is the one that has a good structure and modifier meaning. Okay. So full underline, that stinks. The honeybee stinger as the honeybee stinger. It's heavily barbed sting. This results in, as the honeybee stinger, this results in, no. As the honeybee stinger, stays where it is inserted. As the heavily barbed stinger stays where it is inserted with the result. No, it's just the structure's chaos. The honeybee stinger, heavily barbed, staying where it's inserted, that's describing the stinger, results in. But the honeybee stinger doesn't result in the fact. The fact that it's barbed results in the fact that the act of stinging causes a fatal injury, not the stinger itself. Yeah, so same thing with D. The heavily barbed stinger results in the act of stinging. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say the, heavily, the stinger is heavily barbed, and then that whole thing with the result that, and that's describing this whole thing before, so I'm going to say E. I do not want to do another reading comp passage, but that's the test. Um, okay. Many people believe that because wages are low in developing countries, then in developed countries, competition from developing countries and goods traded internationally eliminate large number of jobs in developed countries. Okay, so that first sentence is gnarly. I gotta, gotta reread it. Many people believe that because wages are low in developing countries. Okay, so many people 
think that low wages in developing in uh, developing countries are going to lose is going to cause jobs in other developed countries. Now I can tell that that's usually the test is not going to like many people think this. The conclusion is going to be like, but not that. Let's see. Currently, developed countries advanced technologies results in higher productivity, which accounts for the higher wages. Oh, I might be wrong. Let's see. Um, this says that advanced technology is why there are higher wages. And technology is moving across borders. But even with the technology, so we have technology moving borders. But, so you might think, well, then they're going to raise the wages in developing countries. But even with the technology, productivity and wages will be lower in developing countries and will remain lower than in developed countries for many years because of infrastructure, because infrastructure. When productivity in a developing country does catch up, experience the wages there will rise. So when productivity catch up, wages will rise. Some individual firms have raised their productivity but kept their wages low. However, in developing countries, Economy as a whole, productivity improvements in goods traded internationally are likely to cause increases in wages. Uh, furthermore, if wages are not allowed to rise, the value of something about the currency, a lot of the past countries have deliberately kept their currencies in value, as their capital moves freely. So I'm going to reread a little bit because I'm, I'm still not quite clear. Uh, so I'm, technology is moving, but even with that, Productivity and wages will remain lower for many years because of the infrastructure and better educated workers. When productivity does catch up, experience is just the wages will rise. And then it's how some firms have kept low, why they're kept low. Okay, primary purpose is to talk about a comparison of wages in developing and developed countries and talk about how it might change based on many different factors, education, technology, infrastructure. Um, and it kind of does say that this is not gonna happen. It says that this probably, not anytime soon anyway, there's a lot that needs to be done before, does it say that? I think it does say that, because it just says there's, there's technology, education, and infrastructure in the developed countries that'll take a while to catch up. So kind of to go against that. Um, identify the origin. No, it's not saying where the misconception comes from. Not to discuss the implications. Present information relevant in evaluating a belief. I think like here's the belief. Well, let's think about it. Let's evaluate that belief. It doesn't defend the controversial assertion. It doesn't explain. Yeah, yeah. see. The passage would suggest, the passage suggests, so inference question that if the movement of capital in the world were restricted, which of the following would be likely? So let's find where it talks about capital being restricted. That's gonna be in the bottom when I was kind of skimming. Um, I know, yeah, it's okay. So in a world where capital moves freely, it's hard for countries to keep their currencies undervalued. So, when capital moves freely, it's hard to undervalue a currency. If capital does not move freely, it's easier to undervalue a currency. So I wanna find an answer that says is, it's easier for countries to deliberately undervalue a currency. Not technology, not about competing, productivity. That's significantly increasing countries' average wages. So I'm a little lost because we're talking about two things now. I really thought I had it. Um, I kept the currency in the that's harder in a world where capital moves freely. So it should be easier to undervalue currency. Mm -hmm. 
not A. Maybe E. Productivity. They would be able, I don't know, man. Nah, I gotta move on. I don't know. Oh God, I only have six minutes left. I gotta move on. See, bad timing, bad seven minutes. Um, passage would suggest which of the following would explain why in a developing country some firms that have raised up productivity continue to pay low wages. Um, passage suggests which of the following would explain why in a developing country some firms have raised up productivity continue to pay low wages. How do they pay low wages when they've increased their productivity? Um, something about infrastructure, because infrastructure seems to keep it down. Maybe a bit lower education, productivity does catch up. <sighs> Guys, I'm tired. Um, and I gotta, I, I didn't read this one very well. I think I just need to move on. Um, wages are not determined by productivity to the extent which labor unions, what? Based on that. Determines wages. Oh God, I think it's gotta be D. I think it's it's because eh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> fossils of a whale that beached, having been beached. Okay, so description. Was fossils were? No. That washed up and was butchered by hominids have been recovered. Okay, so the fossils have been recovered. Uh, not has been, the fossils are plural, so it has to be have. Uh, that beached on a whale and was butchered, have that beached on a shore and then was butchered, was subsequently, why do you say then, that beached on a shore, which was butchered, okay, the shore wasn't butchered, it's not C, oh, I already know it's not C, stop evaluating answers you've already eliminated, uh, and subsequently butchered that having been beached, and but first off, I don't like having been beached, um, I think it's A. Having been beach is a ridiculous modifier. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay as long as I don't have another passage, and I think I do. Recently documented examples of neurogenesis production of branches include. Okay, so recently documented examples of neurogenesis, definition of neurogenesis include. So what are the recently documented examples? The brain growing in mice when placed in a stimulating environment. Uh, or neurons, what? mice whose brains grow, canaries whose neurons increase. I kind of like this. Mice's brains that grow or canaries neurons that increase? No. The brain growth of mice or the increase in canaries' neurons when they uh, Placed in the environment with the increase in canaries as neurons when they when they learn new songs. I like the increase in neurons in canaries that learn brain growth in mice or an increase in neurons. I like E. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so I have three minutes left and one passage. My goal is to get one or two of these and guess. I'm not going to try to get all three. So I still want to read the passage relatively well, even though I'm under time pressure. Some historians contend that. I'm not going to talk as much because I'm running out of time. I apologize. You might have noticed I'm not talking because I'm getting tired. Um, Some historians, World War II, alliance with African-American community, advanced civil rights. Other scholars are like, no, it did not. Um, organized labor as defending all the relative purposes. Yeah, other scholars are like, uh, organized labor protect whites. 
And so clearly these two are not easily reconcilable. The historical value is not reducible to one of the, okay, so the, this is taking like a middle ground. It's like, well, it's complicated. It's, one or, it's, it's not one or the other. It's kind of, it's a complicated situation. Unions face a choice between either maintaining the pre-war status quo for any more inclusive approach to solve for all members to participate in the affairs of the union. Access to skilled and high paying positions. Yeah, so, okay, this is what unions had to choose between. They often voiced an inclusive ideal, but they were often, they often favored intention interest. And then they had to face contradiction. So it's like, it's like, it's a complicated situation. Unions kind of tried to talk out of both sides of their mouth. Um, and then the civil rights movement came after the World War II and they got even like, they had to confront contradictions. So they weren't really helping um, African Americans, even though they kind of acted like they wanted to, it seems to me. So according to the passage, the historians mentioned in the first highlighted portion and the scholars disagree about, you know, what this era meant about um, equality between whites and African Americans. Uh, yeah, okay, one minute left. Um, so something like something about the time period and how much, you know, the bolster, how, how much equality was coming up uh, uh, for entrenched white Americans and African Americans. Um, disagree about contribution made by organized labor, no. Issues most important. No relation between African and that's that seems more or less right. How the unions treated African Americans, uh, which is only best summarized point of view attributed to the historian's mission of highlighted test, text. I'm trying to do this question and then guess on the last one. Point of view. Mindfulness keeps me calm. Lasting relationship. Opinions from contradictions. Yeah. And I'm going to guess on this one because I'm out of time. Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> uh, all right, friends, welcome back. It's so good to see you again. Um, what do we think? What do you notice? I just want some, some brainstorming. Um, what was different about how I did this test than the way you would do this test. So Avi says he was getting more nervous than I was towards the end. It's, yeah, you just have to breathe. Um, I practice, I, I literally did mindfulness. I just, I realized that I was getting nervous because I was running out of time and it was like, just take a breath. The time can't change how you perform. You have to just do the thing anyway. And so you take a breath and you do what you can. Okay, it's important that you don't let it rattle you, even though it's ticking and even though it's pressure. Um, it's, yeah, so another thought about being so calm. You just can't, you know, you can't let it rattle you. Tyra Woods makes millions and millions of dollars not because he's really good on the driving range. It's because when he needs to make a 30-foot putt, he does it way more than most people, you know. Um, Fox, um, I'm usually pretty balanced. Uh, part of the reason, I, I'm not trying to make excuses, although I kind of am. Part of the reason it was uh, um, hard for me to keep time is because I was trying to do two things at once. The, the explaining and thinking and, and trying to make sense of, I probably, you know, it's probably times where I was saying nonsense because I'm trying to do two things at once. So that took time. Um, for some reason it was easier on math actually. Uh, but I do tend to be a little more cautious at the beginning. It's good to be, to avoid silly mistakes early that can really kneecap you. So I do think, you know, not heavily invest in the front, but just be a little more slow. Just take a second, second look before you move on on those first few questions. Um, Sophie's team to skim and go back and forth. Uh, yeah, I don't want to understand everything about the passage on the first read through. That's a waste of time. I try to get the big ideas. I try to notice some big moments. Um, but I don't try to understand everything. There's not time for that. Um, seeing splits in action, uh, in sentence correction note. Yeah. Like I said, I don't always read everything. In fact, a lot of times I didn't read much. Um, CR is, is something I love. I, I love critical reasoning on the test. Um, I think it's interesting. And it's in my best verbal. I'm not going to lie. Um, that's okay. Let's see how I did.
<laughs> because I'm a person. Well, when I say, why do I like this one? Because it's not, it's not, it's how I knew what the meaning of the sentence was. Um, yeah. First and last sentences of reading comp that those tend to have a lot of the weight. Um, why? And so, yeah, why did I like, when I said, why do I like this one? What I meant was, how do I know what this sentence is trying to say? It's because I'm a human. I know what this sentence is trying to say. Um, I'm not, you know, uh, you don't, you're not going to wonder about that. It's, does the sentence mean what I know it's trying to say? That's the question that's always, that you always need to ask. It's going to, you're going to know what it, what it's trying to say. The question is, does it mean what it's trying to say? Okay. Um, so not my best verbal in the world. That's all right. Um, I got a, where'd I go? 42 on the verbal. On the real test, I uh, got a 47 in my most recent exam. But, you know, scores above 40, they are super fragile and verbal. Uh, another question, you know, you miss two questions and you go from a 47 to a 42. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really fragile area. Um, so if you're scoring in that realm, you kind of got to know that luck is going to come into play. If you... Uh, if you're a little tired, if you make a silly mistake, it's going to hurt you more. You're going to lose more points. Um, so I missed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's, you know, I said I wanted to miss, what, three to eight, I think, at the beginning. And this is, I, you know, I can't get a 47 every time. I was shocked when I got a 47. That's an incredible, like most of the time, 45 is as good as it gets. So, I, you know, I can't expect to get that 47. And so many of my students come to me and they're like, Reed, my score is less. It's like, yeah, it's not a perfect test. There's going to be variety, you know. Um, how do we get that skill to pick the right answer? I, Because I, I probably eliminate, I, I'd have to go back to the questions, Avi, about how I picked the right answer even when I was confused. Um, I still probably eliminated a bunch of the wrong answers. Right, I still got rid of answers that I knew were not right, um, and I might have had a had a reason that I would have taken way too long to explain. Um, and sometimes it was just a guess, you know, it was just a fifty fifty guess. Um, uh, but yeah, you just can't expect every test to be your best. Um, I notice I missed these two at the end. That's you know because I ran out of time. I didn't manage my time great today. Um, I missed the third question. Let's, let's see the ones I missed here. What do you recommend to try to capture more points when your verbal oscillates between a 44 and a 45? Honestly, Sophie, I just hate to tell you this. I think it's luck. It's just what questions you get that day. You know, a 40, if you're at a 44 and a 45, you're basically, uh, it's basically as far as that's going to go. Dang it, I really thought I got this critical reasoning exam question, this critical reasoning question right. Um, but Sophie, when you're at a 45, it's just, it's, it's luck. It's just you happen to have a day that you happen to miss one fewer question and now you get a 47 instead of a 45. You know, it just, you, you, it makes big jumps. So I missed this one, really. Inexpensive pesticide, uh, I don't know, I'd have to go back and see that, that was, um, rough. Gainesville times. Oh, I skipped this one. This is one I failed because it was just like, I, it was an accept question. I didn't want to do it. So I didn't do it. Uh, Mr. Reading comp. <clears throat> what did I, I was probably, a, ah, of course. Yeah, I got, I got suckered. I got suckered good. That's definitely what I want. Another reading comp. Reading comp killed me this test. It looks like reading comp was, was rough. Um, yeah, what is being compared is a big question in critical reasoning. You don't want to worry about comparisons that don't matter. Um, all right, friends. So I don't think I missed a sentence. Yeah, I don't think I missed a sentence today. So if anything, this is a good example of sentence correction. Um, notice how, how I worked through that. Um, notice how often I don't read everything. I, you can't, that's not the point. You're reading for structure and meaning and ignoring some of the noise. And there's always noise. You just, you have to find the needles in the haystack there based on what they give you. It gives you hints on what to look for. 
Um, looks like reading comp was tough today. That makes sense. I ran a little bit behind before I got my first reading comp passage and felt like I really had to rush through reading comp. It's actually usually one of my strengths, not today. Um, critical reasoning was, it was okay. Um, missed a few that I thought I got, got suckered by some trap answers happens, but Hey, you know, I got a 42. Um, and so if I get a 42 and a 50, which is what I got on the quant, this is a 92. That's probably a 730, 740. So, you know, these two exams matched together. That's what one version of a 730 or 740 is going to look like. So if you want to have a sense of, of that, you can watch these two videos. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. Uh, I'll field any last questions y'all have, but thank you all for watching. Um, I hope you're noticing kind of how people who master this test really think about it. It's usually, usually there's a new style of thinking when you really master the GMAT and it's, it's like a puzzle in a game. So start thinking a bit like that.